That's the theme from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight, a program of love and hate with Cicely Tyson as your hostess. Here's a preview. Do you really think they'll march? There must be a dozen posters in the law school quad alone saying they will. Did you see that notice saying that a committee is meeting to stop them? Yeah. Do you think I should join? If you want to. Are you? No. The Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station. This is Cicely Tyson. I'm here in the history wing of the world-renowned Burden University. There's a window in the door of this office, and I can see Jill Graham inside. Jill is 25 and very bright. Her Ph.D. thesis is entitled Correlations Between Literature of the Carolingian Renaissance and that of the French 12th century Renaissance. It's a safe scholarly topic, one that makes the ebb and flow of historical events and human passions seem far away. However, history doesn't always wait to be read about in books. Soon something will happen right in Jill's town that will change her life forever. And that cultural force will in turn be only a phrase in a history book to another scholar. But now Jill isn't interested in history in the making. She's interested in the history of ancient civilizations. That's the course that her tutoring pupil, Donna Mardesian, is trying to pass. Who gives a fasoozle about the Peloponnesian War? I don't know any Peloponnesians. I don't even know how to spell it. We study the Peloponnesian War because... I don't consider... care. I don't care. Why bother to learn it? So you can pass the course. That's what you're paying me for, isn't it? And that's only the beginning of our story. Sears Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week brought to you in Elliot Lewis' production of The Sears Radio Theater. Our story, The Great March, by Patricia Joyce. Our stars, Miss Joyce as Jill Graham and Shepard Mencken. The Sears Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops for value. <laughs> Jill Graham is having trouble with her pupil, Donna Mardesian. It seems that Donna has a short attention span and a short temper. She's also short-sighted. She thinks it's easier to blame her frustrations on Jill than it is to buckle down and overcome her own mental blocks. That's so lame. What? But you think this junk matters. It has its purpose in the curriculum. That's really pathetic. You're so pedantic. That's all you think life's about, isn't it? Being holed up on the fifth floor of the library stacks. Getting pasty skin and bags under your eyes. Going cross-eyed reading fine print. That's not the issue here. Do you even have any friends? Come on, Donna, cut it out. What about men? Have you ever met a man who thinks Peloponnesians are a real turn-on? Donna, lay off it. That has nothing to do with the purpose of this meeting, which is to get you to pass your class. Now, either you want to work or you don't. I don't. I already told you that. Then save your money. I'm leaving. Some tutor you turned out to be. Don't blame me if you don't want to work. I don't know why you let Donna upset you so much. I don't either, Ellen. Look, Jill, it's obvious that she's a bad student. She's taking out her frustrations on you. Is it? Sure it is be so mad to think of you taking this jerky girl seriously. But in a sense, she's right. I mean, I do get carried away with my work. But that's good. I do the same thing. Help me get where I am and help you get where you are. That's the problem with that drip Donna. She's not willing to get into her work. Ellen, we've known each other for what, seven years? Yeah. In seven years, I've had two successful relationships. One has been my friendship with you. The other has been my relationship with my history books. I've never had a successful romance. So? Well, I feel that's something I should have. Should have or want to have? Both. 
Oh, I don't know how true all that is. Society says a woman can't be fulfilled without romance, but your life is going to be fulfilled without that. You've got the beginning of a very important career in history. You've got both, law school and Roger. Well, yeah. I just think life is really precious, and I want to know as much of it as I can. I don't know how much I'm learning about people up in the history library. And I'll tell you one thing, Joe. You know a lot more about people than Donna Mardesian does. You know not to try to hurt someone else just because you can't cope. What's wrong, Jill? You look like you just found a cockroach in your soup. Did you see those posters in the quad? No, unfortunately. Gary, it reminds me of Donna Mardesian. Why? You think Donna Mardesian's a member of the American Fascist Party? You think as soon as you're finished tutoring her, she sneaks off to a party meeting, throws on her sexy, tight-fitting stormtrooper's uniform, and writes racist slogans on ladies' room walls? Pretty logical. Seems like something Donna Mardesian might do. Ellen, I'm serious. It's the same psychological problem. Donna was frustrated about her own problems, but rather than deal with them, she focused her anger into attacking me. Now, a lot of these American fascist party guys are frustrated and lonely. Their racial slurs come out of their own unhappiness. I think you're right. I don't want to see the American fascist party marching through Burdenville. We shouldn't have to deal with their hate any more than I should have to deal with Donna Mardesian insulting me. Well, do you really think they'll march? There must be a dozen posters in the law school quad alone saying they will. Did you see that notice saying that a committee is meeting to stop them? Yeah. Do you think I should join? If you want to. Are you? No. But you're Jewish. Look, I don't like what they stand for, obviously, but legally they have a right to march. Isn't it a question of humanity, not legality? The purpose of law is to help society function in an equitable, humane way. <laughs> <laughs> don't you think that's a really pompous statement? Probably. I don't know. I'm going to that committee. Then go. Help you get out of the library. I'm not doing it for social reasons. But you said you wanted to be around people more. Look, I happen to think it's the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to protect their right to free speech. My favorite Oliver Wendell Holmes quote, What the Constitution must protect is not free thought for those who agree with us, but freedom for the thought we hate. I had American History 239. I know what the guy said. <laughs> There's a meeting going on in the Burdenville Community Center. Its purpose is to stop the American Fascist Party from marching through town. So far, it's been a passionate meeting. People were screaming and carrying on about all the different issues. Now they've finally decided on a plan of action. The chairwoman, Rhea Arnold, stands at the podium. She breathes a sigh of relief as she raises her gavel. That concludes today's meeting. Thank you, friends, for coming. Excuse me. I said, excuse me? Mm -hmm. I, I need to get by. Oh. Your books are blocking my way. Oh. oh. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Aren't you coming? Oh, I, I guess I should. Are you all right? I think so. I think I am. Are you ill? Do you, do you need some help getting out? No, no, I'm not fine. The meeting just affected me a lot, that's all. Yes, yes, it, it, it is very unpleasant. The idea of the American Fascist Party marching here in Burtonville. I, I don't understand why people have to be so hateful to each other. Neither do I. It's all through history, people killing other people, pretending it's ideological conflict. All it really is is hate. It's instant replays of the slaughter of the Albigensian heretics. That's what it is. Perhaps, perhaps, although the slaughter of the Albigensians had as much to do with greed and lust for power as it did with hatred. It was the same in Europe during the Second World War. What did you say? It was the same in Europe. Before that. Uh, that the Albigensian crusade was caused by greed and lust for power. The Albigensian crusade in the 13th century? The same. I'm a medieval historian, are you? No, no, 
No, by profession, I'm a doctor. How did you know about the Albigensian heretics? I like to know things. Me too. It's not too late. Would you like to have some pie and coffee together? Ah. Uh... I'd, I'd like to talk with you. I, I think that gentleman over there would like to close the hole. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Um, yes, <laughs> let's. That, that would be nice. My name is Jill Graham. Jan Kamarowicz. Should I call you Dr. Kamarowicz? Only if you want me to look at your x-rays. <laughs> I, I think I spend too much time learning and not enough with people. But they say things all work out. Mm, that's what I was told, too. As I got older, I wondered if indeed it all works out. How's your pie? It's good. Want some? If you'll try mine. What is it? You um, have a tattoo on your arm. Yes. You were in the concentration camp? For five years. Oh. Yes. No wonder you feel cynical. Oh, I'm not the only one in this town. There are, there are many survivors here. I was just angry that the American fascist party was marching. I didn't even think about what it would be like to remember the real fascists to have gone through that. I'm Jewish. Oh. Yes. Does it bother you to talk about the camp? Sometimes, not now. I think that now it is a bit of a release. I felt very angry during the meetings, though. Yet, it is easier to say that I've been in the camps when I'm sitting in a warm coffee shop and seeing a sympathetic face looking at me over a piece of cherry pie. <laughs> it makes those five years seem very far away. But they are far away. An experience like that is never very far from one especially with this little reminder that the American fascist party has planned. How did you do it? Survive, I mean. Oh, I almost didn't. No one else in my family did. I'm sorry. I, I remember the day that we knew we were free. What was it like? For everybody, it was different. Some cried, other people ran around kissing everything. For me... I remember noticing how good everything smelled suddenly. You can't imagine how wonderful life is when you've come so close to losing it. Hey, Jill. Jill. Jill, wait up. Hi, Ellen, where are you going? Oh, constitutional law, how about you? Oh, I've been working on my thesis until my brain cells are all short-circuiting. Now I'm taking a break. I'm going over to the uh, committee to stop the American Fascist Party march. Jiminy won the grandiose title. Going to a committee with a name like that will probably fry your brain even more. Well, I figure that a change of pace will spark me up. What are you going to do? We're campaigning door-to-door -to, -door to get people to support certain town ordinances that will ban the march. What ordinances? Oh, let's see... I was talking about this one a lot last night. They want to ban slogans or symbols like the swastika that would defame a group. I think it makes sense. Did you know that there are a lot of survivors of concentration camps here in Burdenville? I mean, what do you think it would do what are to the other ordinances? Oh, let's see. No marching in paramilitary uniforms like the stormtroopers' uniform. It's almost the same as the first. Oh, oh, what? What's the other one? Let me think. Oh, it's um. They want the American Fascist Party to post an insurance bond for any damages that might result from the march. It'll never hold up under the First Amendment. How can you say that? Because it won't. shouldn't. You sound so confident. Well, you know me. You know I always come off more confident than I am. I really don't know what'll happen. But I tell you, Jill, I could bore you with long legal arguments and precedents. But to me, the basic issue is, are we going to have freedom of speech or not? If we are, it's a costly freedom. I guess sometimes some people have to pay a higher price for that freedom than others. We're not talking about textbook cases. We're talking about people. I met this doctor for coffee after the meeting, and you if you... had a doctor? No, hey. it's... <laughs> it's nothing like that. He's a lot older than me, and he's married. He also has a teenage daughter. He's, he's just a nice man who wanted to talk. Anyway, 
He was in the concentration camps for five years, Owen. He's been through so much pain. Why should he have to be insulted by those fascist idiots? Isn't there such a thing as protection for mental cruelty? Why should he have those old wounds opened up again, you know? It just doesn't seem fair. Well, it doesn't seem fair to deny people the right to speak, does it? No. Oh, Ellen, I don't know. It's all so confusing. All I know is that right now, I need to get over to my committee meeting. I'll see you tomorrow. Hey, have a good time with your doctor. Ellen! <laughs> off the TV news and ignore events that are happening halfway around the world. Not so easy when those events are happening in your hometown. For weeks, the townspeople of Burdenville could talk of nothing but the upcoming march by the American Fascist Party. I've been thinking about all that you've been through in the camps and everything. It makes my intellectual agonizing seem pretty foolish. No, you mustn't say that. We each have our own struggles. And I must tell you, I have been so disappointed with myself. When I was in the camps, I said that people don't appreciate life. They don't see how precious it is. They don't realize how fully it must be used. And yet, I don't know that I have used these 30 years since the war so well. But we all fall short of our aspirations. I think that makes life more exciting. Even when I reach one of my goals, I set up a new one. <laughs> Don't you? Yes, yes, that's true, yes. I hope I won't upset you if I ask you this. But, um, do you think that the American fascist party could ever be as powerful as the German fascist party? Anything is possible. There is one important difference between the American fascists and the Germans. It saddens me very much. Many Germans claim they knew nothing of the Holocaust until the war was over. I think it is true that they did not know. However, the American fascist party is aware of all the atrocities that some of the Germans committed. And yet they still persist in wanting to be like those killers. It's really ugly. That's why, even with your First Amendment, freedom of speech, I think what they do is illegal. Why? Because the party openly advocates racism. To me, just the act of wearing the swastika is an act of identifying oneself with the Holocaust. Oh, this, this only saddens me. Perhaps it's better if we talk of other things. And then things became so very different between Trudy and me. Right around the time that she was pregnant with Ilana. Why? I would be lying if I told you that I understood the reasons. Oh. Well, what happened? I think the word arid, arid, best explains what my marriage is like. Arid? Yes, it's, it's, it's like your southwestern deserts. My marriage... Well, it's strong. It, it, it's a very real force in my life, and I believe it is a force in Trudy and Ilana's life. Yet, yet there's no passion. Nothing grows there. Then why did you get married? Ah, oh, oh. it was not always that way. I first met Trudy after the war during my burst of idealism when I really thought that the world could change and be better. Things were so good with us then, so fresh. Now we've lived together like brother and sister for almost 20 years. Yet, at least, I have the memory of that first tenderness to console me. You're like me. You're too hard on yourself. Hmm? Perhaps. Really? How are you hard on yourself? Oh, I'm a perfectionist, you know. So I take it really hard when something like a relationship doesn't work out. This is not just a relationship. It is, it's my marriage. Jan, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't complain about my marriage. This is rare for me. I, oh. Oh, it's my fault. My disappointments and expectations are so intense. I, I think I overemphasize. What of you? 
What of you? Have you a nice friendship? Do you mean do I have a boyfriend? No. I can't believe this. I get along well with women, especially my best friend Ellen, and I usually have excellent relationships with my professors and the undergrads I tutor, except for this one girl, Donna Mardesian. But, well, I don't know, with men, either they aren't smart enough or they're too wishy-washy, or if they are guys I like, they don't like me. But why is that? I don't know. But you're so lovely. I think I'm insecure. You should be very confident, a successful young woman like yourself. Oh, knock it off. You sound like my mom. I should be this, I should be that. Well, in some things, I'm a failure, you know? I mean, some things may not go the way I'd like them to. That's just the breaks for me. You're very young. Twenty-five isn't so young. Is time enough? I don't care anyway. Yes, you do. Not that much. It's getting dark. I better go. I will walk you home. You don't have to. It's getting dark. Well, the problem is it's the doctor I told you about, Ellen. What doctor? Oh, Ellen, you remember Jan Kamerowitz, the one who's on the committee to stop the march? The one with the wife? Right. Terrific. Oh, I know it's not smart, but I've been spending a lot of time with him, you know, after we finish our volunteer work and everything, just as friends. Only I've, um started thinking about him in a romantic way. I guess that in some way it's healthy for me. He's the first man I've known that I've felt compatible with. What do you mean by that? It's like being with you. Oh, yeah? <laughs> no. <laughs> Only it's different because you're different people, of course, and there's the whole man-woman undercurrent with Jan. Anyway, I, I can be relaxed and be myself around him. And he's sensitive and intelligent enough to know what I'm saying. Sometimes... I think he understands what I'm trying to get across better than I do myself. Sounds good, Jill. Yeah. Gonna do anything about it? That's just it. I don't know if there's anything to do. For all I know, he might think I'm just another mousy-haired graduate student. Oh, I can't imagine anyone calling your hair mousy. Any more than I can imagine someone thinking of you as just another graduate student. See, that's another thing. He's real supportive, just like you are. He's also married. Yeah. With a teenage daughter. Well, maybe my romantic feelings will all kind of blow over. Maybe. What's new with you? Enough about me. Well, Roger's in the tax law class this quarter, so I never see him. What's happening on your committee now that the town ordinances have passed? Or do you spend all your time daydreaming about your doctor friends? <laughs> no. no, we have to go to court. The American Fascist Party says we're denying their freedom of speech. We're trying to raise the money to hire a really good lawyer. I knew they would. I hope they uphold the freedom of speech. Well, that's encouraging. Jill, I'm a bleeding-heart liberal law student. Wait until I get out in the cold, cruel world and someone from your committee offers me the case in favor of the town ordinances. I'd change my color soon enough. Would you argue the case to uphold the ordinances? Not me. But I'd be tempted. Fascinating issue. Does free speech give someone the right to be offensive? Does it? Well, the danger is that if the court decides that offensive speech is illegal, then somebody has to decide what is offensive and what isn't. That's not healthy. Having someone dictate what's morally right and what's morally wrong. Too much censorship power. I see what you mean. You do? Sure. Then how come you're trying to stop the march? Well, my gut tells me to stop them. <laughs> Even if my head knows that they probably should be allowed to march. Ah. Uh, you know what really worries me? Hmm? What if there's a riot or something? Couldn't the American Fascist Party be arrested then? I don't think so. Not unless they incite the riot. Why? There's this case, Bordinella versus the city of Philadelphia. A priest was giving a ridiculously bigoted speech, and the crowd rioted. He was arrested on breach of peace, then acquitted because he didn't urge or incite the riot. It's been used as a precedent to protect civil rights workers and stuff. Oh, boy, what a confusing mess. <laughs> don't knock it. We lawyers need those messes to make a living. Ellen! Just <laughs> kidding. Gee. How's your scampi? Fine. So quiet. It's really nice of you to take me out to dinner. Generous. Well, you're the one who's generous. 
Your friendship has given me back some of my old zest for life. Thank you. Please don't be offended. At what? My affection for you. I didn't know. No? You mean... affection? <laughs> I, I thought it was written on me. I thought you must... You must see it. I didn't see it. You're angry? Do I look angry? No. I really feel affection for you, too. I know you're married, but A I... man may be married and be attracted to another woman. But he has responsibilities to that woman as well as his wife. If the marriage is a strong one, the other woman could perhaps be hurt. If not, the wife... I know. I thought about that, too. You did? Yes. I don't know what to say, Jan. I, I only know that I've been a lot less lonely since we've been friends. Champagne was the most fascinating thing about the 12th century Renaissance. Oh? Why is that? It seems to me that was the first time women as a group were considered as a real social force. Did you know that during the Middle Ages, one of the church councils actually debated whether or not women had souls? No, I didn't. They decided that we did. How, <laughs> how brilliantly perceptive of them. <laughs> we're here. Yes. I love talking with you. And I, you. I can always tell when you're feeling vulnerable. You say, yes. And then your eyes get all misty. I do? <laughs> yes, I must. I find myself wanting to say yes right now. <laughs> yes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I can't ask you to come in, Jan. I can't. It's not just a question of whether I care for you or not. It's... There's too much else involved, you know? Yes. Good night. Jill? What? Whatever it is you decide, I trust you. Do what is right for you, and it will be right for me, too. serious students allowed. All who dare enter must keep a vow of silence. Otherwise, stay out. Are you studying? That and cooking split pea soup on my illegal hot plate. I hope you're not the local sheriff. I need to talk. When will you finish? Oh, well, come on in. Can you spare the time? Oh, Jill. If I read one more contract, my eyes are going to grow fur. I think I'm a masochist to study this much. What do you think? I think I need to borrow your brilliant legal mind to help me solve a problem. Oh, no. Not that. I can't take that. Sacrifice me to the biology lab for dissection purposes. Devour my split pea soup. Leave me to starve. But please don't make me use my legal mind anymore. Ellen. <sighs> I'm sorry. I'm just punchy from cracking the books all day. I'll say. Huh. Really? What's up? Want some soup? No, thanks. It's about Jan. Oh? I don't know what to do. A week ago, Jan took me out to dinner and told me that he loved me. A week ago? Why didn't you tell me? I still thought it might blow over, I guess, or maybe I wanted to be sure of what was happening before I said anything. So, what's happening? I don't know what love means, really. I, I think that word is used to describe so many different kinds of feelings. Even, you know, feelings that are ugly, like... Forcing another person to act a certain way because you love them. Or fighting wars for love of country or some ideal. Or joining the American fascist party for the love of your own ethnic group at the expense of the rest of humanity. Right. Anyway, my, my feelings for Jan are different from anything I've ever felt for a man before. I can talk to him on an equal level. We're interested in the same things. But, but it's more than that. We're... Aware of each other's needs and, and 
what we can do to make things better for each other. I know what you mean. I feel that way about Roger. There are all these things in the way. I don't know if I have the strength to deal with them. And I don't even know if I should deal with them. I don't like that word, should. You know that. To me, it seems like you're worried about what society says you should do. Not making up your own mind from your own personal values. I want to make up my own mind. Well, what's the problem? Well, he's a lot older than I am, but I think I can handle that. You do? It's a more clear-cut thing. All I have to ask myself is, do I care enough about him to want to be with him when I'm middle-aged and he's an old man? The answer is yes. What else? Well, the big problem is his marriage. He's been married for 25 years to a woman named Trudy. He has a daughter, Ilana, who just turned 19. He and Trudy really haven't been husband and wife since their daughter was born. You really? You believe that? Yes. Anyway, I don't think sex is the most important thing in a marriage. Jan and Trudy have other things. Oh, Ellen, it's awful. If I get involved with him, I'll hurt a woman and girl that I don't even know. People who mean a lot to Jan. But if he doesn't leave Trudy, it'll be just terrible for me. I couldn't love someone and be second. Don't do that, Joe. Remember how I felt when I found out Barry Simpson was seeing me and Lisa Kelly? Destroyed my self-esteem. Yeah. And then there's Jan. He must be quite a man. He is, but I don't know if he could handle the confusion of having a relationship with two women. He really respects Trudy. I don't know what it would do to him to hurt her or me. I just don't know. My brilliant legal mind is hearing all these great reasons against getting involved. What are the reasons for doing it? That was the first thing I told you. I love him. Oh, right. I don't know. Seems to me, Jilly, that your feelings about this man are the same as your feelings about the march that brought you together in the first place. The American Fascist Party march? No, the march of history. Of course, the American Fascist Party march. You think of that as... No, wait. It's more than that. There's a conflict between your gut reaction and your mind, your heart and your head. Your heart says, I hate what the American Fascist Party stands for. I don't want them to march. Your head says, but if I stop them from marching, I may set a precedent that will restrict freedom of speech. Am I right? Yeah, something like that. So. Okay. Your heart says, I love Jan Kamarowitz. But your head says... If I get involved with this man, there will probably be painful repercussions for everybody concerned. <laughs> Listen to me. I sound so logical, and you're over there tearing yourself to bits. No, no, I see what you mean. It's a good point. If only I knew which voice to listen to. Both. Look, if I get corny for a second, promise not to tell anybody. Promise. I think the mind and the heart, or emotions, or whatever you want to call it, are very... Precious gifts. It would almost be going against the life force not to use them to their fullest advantage. They are both like guides, to me anyway. I listen to my heart, then I listen to my head, and eventually I know inside what I have to do. What should I do about Jan? I don't know, Jill. That's your decision. After all, your heart and head give you different messages than mine give me. Hi, Jan. How are you? Very good. Very good. What is it you wanted to tell me? A lot. First of all, I'm leaving the committee to stop the march. Why is this? I still don't like what the American Fascist Party stands for. But I guess I finally realize that this free speech thing is important to me, too. Well, it's important to all of us. Yes, but... Rhea Arnold and I have been talking. We think that we have found a solution that will satisfy most of the committee members. What's that? Since the town ordinances were declared unconstitutional under the First Amendment, we must allow the American Fascist Party to march. Really, we have to? Yes, yes. Legally, we must. However, we think that the most effective way to protest them would be to pay them no attention, to ignore them. These overgrown bullies do not even merit a counter-demonstration. 
They'll give a march and nobody will come. <laughs> That's great. So, you can still be with the committee and satisfy your conscience. No, Jan, it's more than that. Uh, I can't stay with the committee because I can't see you anymore, at least for a while. What about friendship? I feel like I've done something awful letting my emotions get carried away with me. I should have known it would be bad to get so attached to you. How can you say that? Oh, I don't know. I, I know I can't get involved with you in a physical way. It, it would just hurt you and me and your family too much. I should have seen that. I should have known what I was getting into. I, I should have stayed in the library where I belong. Yes. What's that supposed to mean? Yes, yes, yes. You do belong in the library. You are a brilliant scholar. But you also belong with people. You are one of the most sensitive and caring people I have ever met. Oh, sure. Till I understand that it would be hard if we became more deeply involved. I believe it is a wise decision you have made. But please don't say that our friendship should not have been. You have helped to bring back my passion for life. Something that I thought had died forever. But it's painful. What? Getting close and breaking off. Perhaps there is some pain mixed with the joy. Joy? Has it not been a joyous friendship? Yes. Will you be angry if I tell you something? How do I know until you tell me? I hope that I can take this passion for life that I have rediscovered with you and bring it back to my family. Why? So I can keep alive what you have brought out in me. That way, I can feel your presence even if I don't see you. Then I hope you stay happy. And what of me? What of me? Have I given you nothing? Confidence. Caring for a, a man whom I admire, I, I never thought that was going to happen for me. You will use this for me? How? By using the library for studying, not for hiding. By believing that there are other men who will care for you as I have. Men you will like. I'll try. Don't try. Do it. Okay. It is ironic, you know. What? That this march, which I hate so much, has helped to bring back the joy of life that I lost when the real fascists first came to my home. Has it really? My happiness after the war was a false happiness, a reaction to intense sadness. That happiness I have felt knowing you is something I have not felt since I was very little. It is a happiness that is best appreciated by people who have once felt very disillusioned. An innocent happiness. I, I hope you can understand a little. A little. Hmm? Then that is enough. Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears, Roebuck, and Company, where our policy is satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Sears, where America shops for value. The Great March was written by Patricia Joyce, produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your hostess was Cicely Tyson. Our stars were Patricia Joyce and Shepard Minkin. Featured in the cast were Mary Jane Croft, and Janet Waldo. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. This is Art Gilmore speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Sears Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI.